Hey everybody, this is Dr. Langdon. Today's video is a little different and I wanted to share with you a story that I experienced during my residency. I thought of doing this sort of video for several reasons. You might have noticed on TikTok there's been a trend about sharing things uh, that changed brain chemistry and this would certainly be one of those stories for me. Also, a friend of mine, well, an internet friend of mine, PD Mom, P-E-D-I-M-O-M, is a pediatric emergency department uh, physician who shared some of her stories and how realizes how these things that happen to us as uh, healthcare providers really change how we see the world and help explain to you guys some of our passion about certain topics. And you'll see that as I share more of these stories of things that have changed my brain chemistry. So let me take you back to my internship year. Things have changed a lot. I am getting older. And when I was an intern, there were no limits on the number of hours that we house staff would spend in the hospital. There have been multiple changes in healthcare through the years since then. And don't get me wrong, it is extremely important that we no longer require physicians in training to work a solid 40 hours with no sleep. That was idiotic at the time because we're physically human beings and the rates of mistakes go up astronomically. And driving home after those 40 hour long sessions was the same as driving drunk. I clearly remember falling asleep at every single red light with the horns blaring as soon as it turned green because I was soundly asleep at the wheel. It was horribly dangerous and stupid. So I am very thankful that the laws have changed and now apply to residents that can't work for that many hours. Well, nonetheless, they had not changed it at that time. And, you know, it is typical that in your intern year, you will get some rough assignments or some very work intense assignments. And you, you can't be more work intense than the neonatal intensive care unit. So I was the intern on call one night and we had, as most NICUs, uh, different sections for babies with different sort of disorders. So we jokingly said uh, the pod or the unit with all the babies that were extremely premature was uh, a womb with a view. <laughs> we thought we were very clever for that one. Well, anyway, that particular night, I had a baby, many babies in my care, but one was a 30-week infant, a little girl, precious family. Uh, they lived over uh, the, uh, the border of a different state, uh, but we were the closest university medical center with a neonatal intensive care unit, so they were there because the baby had been born at 30 weeks. And honestly, this baby was progressing nicely. Preemies come with all manner of complications, setbacks, long roads to recovery, long hospital stays, particularly the extremely low birth weight infants. And at that time in my residency, which would have been starting in 95, uh, the fall of, or summer of 95, we, the, the edge of viability or the ability to survive outside the womb, the uterus, was around 24 weeks at the very most. And even then, just extreme morbidity or, or long-term complications from that uh, very early prematurity. And I currently have in my very own clinic now an infant who is doing surprisingly well, lots of complications still, but uh, who was born at 23 weeks and one seventh. So I don't want you to think that if you are just tired of being pregnant and you're 30, 31, 32 weeks, that it would be better just to get it over with and get the baby out. Absolutely not. All premature infants have very high rates of complications. The initial and primary one is respiratory and lungs and breathing, but then after that it's GI and uh, feeding and nutrition and getting in adequate uh, calories and the ability to suck and swallow and breathe and coordinate and all of that. It's very complicated. So back to this baby in the NICU, she had been relatively stable. She was basically just working up on her feeds is what we say. They often can have apnea and bradycardia, and she had been doing better with that. We do use caffeine to treat apnea of prematurity. And she had weaned off her caffeine, if I'm remembering correctly, pretty sure. Uh, she was, I think she was even all the way up to just plain room air and not on any respiratory support at this point. Because she was no longer just having been born. She had been born at 30 weeks, but we were weeks past that now. And she was tolerating, we start with, they're called trophic feeds. I mean, just you know, a few mLs per hour. We were working our way up to real feeds and then bolus feeds and 
and she had been tolerating this and just a beautiful little baby having appropriate weight gain. Well, all of a sudden, one night, she went into absolute respiratory distress, sat her oxygen saturations, her pulse oximetry plummeted. Her respiratory rate increased dramatically. She developed severe respiratory distress. We checked an arterial blood gas, an ABG. It was terrible. So I intubated her at the bedside. I always joke now that I don't, never intubate people with teeth because as a pediatrician, especially in the NICU, it, you just intubate a lot of babies who obviously don't have teeth yet. So, um, she was still pretty small, so it would have been a very small ET tube, probably 2.5, which was at, at least at the time the smallest that they came. Well, anyway, we got her stabilized from a respiratory standpoint, had to put her back on the vent, but uh, we measure abdominal girth in a preemie babies in case something bad happens, and hers suddenly increased. Her belly was tight and hard. That is horrible. So we uh, stat paged ped surgery on call. They came to her bedside and the NICU evaluated her, took her straight to the operating room. And of course we had already had her placed on the ventilator and, and they took her down there. They opened her up. And when they opened her up, it was too late. It was too far gone. There was nothing they could do. She had something called necrotizing enterocolitis and her entire gut was necrotic. It was dead. So all they could do, the surgeons, and, and they were very uh, just saddened and shocked by this as well. They just sutured, you know, just, they just closed her and, and brought her back to the NICU. And obviously we called the parents and um, we scheduled a time because we left her on the vent for a while. It was just a matter of time. Even then we couldn't have been able, wouldn't have been able to keep her alive. And so um, we extubated her or took her off, took the uh, ET tube, the endotracheal tube out, took her off the ventilator and placed her in her parents' arms so they could hold her as she died. And it was horrible, horrible, horrible. This was their first baby. They were precious. They just adored her. And then it just went downhill from there. After all this played out, I would later be asked to speak to the next year of interns about how to handle death. And I have no idea how this, what I managed to get through would have been handling it well, I don't know, but evidently my neonatologist thought so. So it turns out that the person who's responsible for getting the casket for a baby who passes away in the NICU is the intern on call. Thanks, like I wasn't suffering enough from having been through that whole horrible night of intubation in the OR and a horrible finding in the OR and, and you know, and I hadn't had sleep and, it was just, uh, it was a terrible time. So I went to the morgue. I had never even been to the morgue before. Fortunately in pediatrics, that's not a place we typically go. And so I went to the morgue and it just kept getting sadder and sadder. Um, I had her weight. And so I told um, the person who helps you in the morgue and they came back with, it was no bigger. It looked like a shoe box, but it was made of wood, just plain wood. And um, I took it back to the NICU. And by now, you know, it's the next day. The sun is up. The parents have been calling around frantically trying to figure out what to do. Uh, they called the funeral home in their home state. Like I said, they had had to cross over a state border to be in our NICU. And apparently it was going to be extremely expensive, as in thousands and thousands of dollars, for their funeral home to come to our university medical center and carry the baby across state lines. But it was fully legal for the family to carry the baby back to their local funeral home in just the family car. And so they had flowers, they had lots of cute outfits, they had all kinds of things that we had to pack up onto that. You've seen the metal rolling carts that we use in the hospital, so we got all that packed up. Um, they had already purchased her um, a white christening gown. And so, whoo, gracious. And they got her all dressed up in her white christening gown and put her in the coffin that I had gone, the little casket that I had gone to get from the morgue. And then we put her on top of that double um, metal rolling cart. And then I went with them. And, um, you know, I was wearing my scrubs and my white coat and my beeper. We didn't have cell phones then. And I rode with them in the elevator and it was a pretty busy elevator. And I remember thinking if the other people had any idea that that shoebox size 
wooden box on top of the rolling cart was a casket with a baby in it and a beautiful white christening gown. And then we got off the elevator and I stood with the mom and the cart while the dad went to get the car and drive it around to pick us up. We were in the main lobby of the hospital. And I remember thinking, keep yourself under control. Stuff your emotions into a box and put a lid on it and just shut up. Don't sniff, don't, don't start, because if you start, you won't be able to stop. Just stop it, just suck it up and go. You can do this, be professional. And I was thinking, I'm professional, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a professional doctor, I'm a doctor. I'm standing there with the mom. And then um, the dad pulls up in the front. We see him say, oh, look, there he is. Let's go um, get it, get loaded up for you guys. And, and um, I'll be praying for you guys to have a safe trip back. And um, I was helping put like, the flowers in and um, things like that. And then um, I put the casket on the back seat. Still managing to sort of hold it. I mean, I was sad, but I was holding it together because I had to. I was still at work. I still had babies to see and charts to do and rounds to make and notes to make and orders to place and labs to look at and all that. And I hadn't slept the whole night before. And um, then the dad put the seat belt around the casket. And I have no idea why that got me. I think I was thinking about uh, in a normal situation, this baby should be in a car seat, rear face again, who'd be snapping the seatbelt around her to protect her. And it just hit me all of a sudden. It's too late. It doesn't matter. Why does it matter if we put a seatbelt around the casket? Because she's already gone. It's too late. And then it just hit me that this was a 30-week baby. She shouldn't have died of this stupid necrotizing in her colitis. I mean, there was nothing we did wrong. There was nothing they did wrong. It just happened. It was just bad luck because prematurity stinks. And then I just fell apart <laughs> and I hugged her and I hugged the dad and um, I went back in the lobby, just tears streaming down my face and found a bathroom as quickly as I could and just um, sucked it all back in and put a lid on it to try to save it for a different day and cry about it later. And a lot of times in residency, that's all you could do. You grieve with the family at the time, but you just have to keep working so you don't have time to process and I think maybe that's a trauma that changes a lot of people's brain chemistry. It is certainly the reason why I chose not to do any of the ICUs, NICU or PICU, and, and hats off to the people who are able to do that. But there's just a lot more death than there is in a general outpatient practice setting. And I still admire the people who are able to do that. Whew, but I'm not one of those people. So why the neonatologist thought I handled that so well, I have no idea, unless it was just that. I love that baby, I love that family, and I just completely lost it because I, I did love them. And so I think everybody wants a physician who actually cares about them and their baby. It's just, I don't think I could do that over and over and <laughs> keep my sanity. And um, so just wanted to let you know, uh, this is the first and maybe a set of stories that will explain some trauma uh, during residency. Thanks for listening.